You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazer reporter, Mike Richmond. You are listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making Locked On Blazers your first listen every single day. It's free on all platforms, five days a week, coming at you every single weekday. So make it a first listen, make it part of your daily routine. And today's show is a very, very special one. If you're watching on YouTube, the surprise has already been spoiled. We are joined by Raphael Barlow, the director of scouting at NBA Big Board, the host of Locked on NBA Draft, and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. Raphael, how you doing, man? I'm good, and you forgot to add a title lifelong blazers fan oh yeah like you did you did tell me that lifelong blazers fan yeah 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 um that's that's the real yeah. credentials here that matter up top i should have led with that you know what when we bring you back for the second segment i'll hit you with uh i'll make sure i get that one in your tags um as someone who has spent a ton of time watching draft you know you're literally traveling all over the world to watch draft prospects scout youngsters um this time of year Everyone tries to be Raphael Barlow. They, they become draft experts. Uh, what is, just like real quick, what is that like to see, like kind of you spend all of your time doing this to see mm-hmm. the Mike Richmonds of the world jump in March 1st and say, oh, okay, I, I kind of like Chad Holmgren. Here's what I see. Well, I guess it's like a two-fold question. For you covering Locked On Blazers, it means the Blazers are bad, that you actually care. <laughs> That's, that's the part that um because i i still look at it from a fan first like you sure. know i mean now that i've been given these credentials i'm still a fan of the of the game first right and, and so at this point you know you don't like seeing your team in in the lot even though it can be exciting but it's one of those things where you'd rather be hoping all right can we contend for for a championship as opposed to let's see which 18 or 19 year old is going to turn the franchise around. And um, it's, but it, it's fun. I mean, I, I enjoy it time of year where not everybody starts to pay attention to the work that I've started putting in back in August and September. And like, even like, for example, I put with my website, NBA draft junkies.com, or even like my YouTube channel, I make a video on a guy in September and it may have, you know, a hundred views. And then all of a sudden now you're starting to see that, everything is starting to spike up because of the tournament and also teams that, you know, like are understanding like, okay, we're not going to make the playoffs. Now let's look at the guys that the mock drafts are saying that are, are in our range. And then now like I'm getting the views on YouTube and, and, and all that stuff. So it's kind of like, yes, it, it's time that people are starting to pay attention to everything that I started doing as early as, as last summer. Yeah, exactly. The, the work you've put in is uh, people people are catching up to it some nine months later. Uh, what do you, you know, there's basically three names that are pretty, uh, I don't know, set in stone uh, consensus mm-hmm. at the top of the draft. Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga, uh, Jabari Smith from from Auburn, and Paolo Bencaro from Duke. What do you think about those three? What order do you have them in? Um, just kind of your thoughts on the top guys. Yeah, I'm going against the consensus a little bit here. I have Paolo number one. All right. I've seen him. I think he's the one that uh, most draft boards you'd see as number three. Right. But I have him number one. And uh, I, I'd have Chet two and Jabari number three. And the reason I have Paolo number one is because I don't think that he's been used correctly in, in Duke's offense. Um, I, I see him more as a point forward. And he's pan, playing like a traditional four, even though he has had some games where he's had like 10 assists and four or five assist games. But I think it's one of those things where, and, and, and with, with Duke, because they have so many other guards that may not be as good off the ball, and because he's also effective in the post, he's not had, he hasn't had the opportunity to showcase like his ball handling and his passing skills. And I think with NBA spacing, he'll be able to, I guess, showcase more of the tools that he has in his toolbox. And then... Yeah. I mean, you saw the Gonzaga game at the beginning of the season when he outplayed Chet. Yep. <laughs> you know, it was, it was hands down. And if it wasn't for him cramping, he probably would have had like 30 points. Yeah, I mean, he could, he's at his size with his like skill set. Like I haven't watched him nearly as much as you. I never watched him play as a, before he got to Duke. Like I never saw him play. Mm-hmm. I never watched those Team USA games or anything like that. Like 
just six ten with the handle, like yeah. that's intriguing. Like that, he that can create his own shot. And I think like so, it, it's funny. Like I talk about from a fan perspective, like. I'm a huge Blazers fan. The Blazers have been my team for a while. And I felt like one of the things that Portland has always lacked is another guy that can score or a front player that can create for others. I mean, think about like the team that went to the conference finals a few years ago. I mean, uh, Aminu and Harkless were guys that they shot decent from three, but if they got a hard closeout, they couldn't put the ball on the floor right. or make a play for others or – Dame never really had a, a four man that he could run the pick and roll for. And the guy could get the ball in the middle of the floor and throw a lob to the Nurk or, or, or hit, you know, uh, just make another play. I felt like the Blazers have been ranked near the bottom of the league in assists because they didn't have a front court playmaker, even though I think Nurk is a pretty good passer. So when I look at a guy like Van Carroll, I think he can be your, he can play next to a Dame or he can play next to a superstar wing and then if a team decides to trap that wing, you got a front court player that can do what Draymond used to do for, or what he still does to where, you know, you can't trap Steph Curry. Cause if you give the ball to Draymond in the middle of the floor, he's going to make. A right. You decision. have, you have a really serious advantage in a four on three. Yeah. I, I, that's yeah. interesting. I haven't, you know, most of people, most of the talk about Ben Carroll is the isolation ability and the, and the shooting. I hadn't, um, I haven't heard many talk about that sort of, true point forward skills that's 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 an interesting one um yeah and i mean i guess i wouldn't say he's like a point forward where you're gonna see him you know run the offense like a scotty pippen or grant hill but i think he is a very very good secondary guy maybe like where, blake, blake griffin was uh like like exactly a pa- yeah, a yeah passer a passer at his size with his athletic ability that's interesting yep uh is chet gonna be a star Man, you know, Chet is so difficult to compare because you don't have anybody that you can compare him to in a sense, which, I mean, it could be a good thing. Do I think he's going to be a star? I think he's going to be a – I think he's going to be a really good complimentary all-star. And so – and that's why I have Ben Carroll, number one, because I think Ben Carroll is your guy that can also get you a basket. Right. He doesn't necessarily need to be set up you can run, you can give him the ball in a post and kind of clear out. And then he can either make a play for himself, ISO or post up or, or, and I think Chet is someone that's going to get most of his points as, you know, with someone setting him up, him spying up from three, maybe, you know, you'll, you'll see him like attack a closeout, but I think he's too skinny to where you could just give him the ball in the post and say, Hey, go get me a bucket. So I think he, he's going to be more reliant on, someone else to give him the ball. And that's why I have, I have a uh, Ben Carroll number one, but Chet is going to be, I think he's going to be like a, what I would call like a complimentary all-star. I don't think he's going to be like your franchise guy that, that, you know, you, even like if he's, if he's like Rudy Gobert with more offense, as right. good as Rudy is, Donovan is the one that makes that team go on the offensive yeah, end, and no Rudy matter Gobert, how great you are on defense. Yeah, Rudy Gobert is one of the best defenders in the history of the of the sport and is going to probably make the Hall of Fame right away when he gets done. But like people he's still not don't an understand anchor. his value. Yeah, he's not he's not <laughs> an anchor of a team because offense is more at this stage of the way the league works, perimeter offense is just more important. Yeah. And I just think like if you're a center in today's NBA. Um, unless you're like Jokic or Embiid, most guys need someone to give them the ball. And Embiid, I mean, yes, of course he needs someone to give him the ball, but you can just say, here, I'm going to dump you the ball in the post and you're going to get us a clean look or foul or a basket. And I yeah, don't they, know if Chet is there because of just because of how skinny he is. Do you worry about the frame? Do you, like, do you worry about Chet's frame? Yeah, I do, but not as much because he's, he's, I mean, he's tough. I'm not saying like guys who are skinny <laughs> and have injuries aren't tough. Um, but I mean, even if you look at like, you know, you always hear the comparisons to Porzingis. Yeah. But if you look at like Anthony Davis was really skinny and he was, I, I want to say last time I looked it up, Anthony Davis was at least 220 when he came into the NBA as a rookie. Chet is 195. So Oof. it just shows how skinny Chet is. And Chet has had like, I mean, I'm sorry, AD is still just, you know, I mean, he's always on the floor. Yeah. And he's put on like 20 to 30 pounds since oh, entering yeah, the NBA. Way bigger. 
and, and some say that it could be because he was growing too fast. You know, they say that he made that that big jump, and maybe I don't know. Um, but I mean, I think there's always concerns whether it's fair or not to kind of put a injury label concern on him because of his frame. I don't know if that's fair or not. I think the Porzingis comparisons might be a little bit unfair too, because Porzingis has, you know, I guess he's been like a part-time player in a sense. Yeah. Uh, But I mean, I guess it, it, you know, it may concern me a little, but not as much. Uh, Jabari is number one on a lot of people's boards. Why is he Mm -hmm. number three on yours? Um, Well, one, I think um, he may be number one over Chet in in some boards because he's like almost a full year younger. And for some people that that really matters. Um, I think Jabari is is similar to Chet in a sense. I think he does have a little bit of shot creation, but I don't think when he does create his own shot, it's an easy shot. It's going to be a tough, tough contested pull up. He makes a lot of hard jumpers. I haven't seen him a bunch, but I've seen him a little. He makes a lot of hard jump shots. Yeah, he makes a lot of tough. And but you know, there's some people that say the thing about Ben Carroll is that he shoots a lot of off the dribble mid range shots. Yeah. Um, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that um, Jabari is a great shooter. I mean, he's yeah. not just a great shooter for his size. He's a great shooter, and um, he's someone that I was totally wrong about. I did not like him coming into college basketball. I thought he was. Well, people are gonna laugh at this, but I thought he was Channing Fry because when I watched all of his AU games, all he did was shoot threes. Now he has went to the post a little bit this year. He has shown some mid range. He's shown a little bit of, I mean, I guess we'll go back to my Blazers take, a little bit of that LaMarcus Aldridge turnaround, high arcing shot that you can't really alter. So he has developed a little bit of, um, I guess, self creation skills. But he's someone, and again, I guess I keep, it's so easy to talk Blazers. He's someone because Rasheed Wallace is my favorite player of all time. Oh, there you go. He he is someone that I could see falling into the Rasheed Wallace trap of all you do is shoot threes. Right. Take too many jumpers. Don't use your physical gifts. I hear that. Yes. And uh, and I mean, I'm a huge Rasheed fan. I used to wear Air, high top Air Force Ones <laughs> <laughs> my whole like teenage in college and my college career uh, because of Sheed. I didn't comb my hair because of Sheed. But once he started making threes, he stopped going to the to the post. And I could see Jabari falling into that range of all right all I'm going to do is shoot threes and which he's going to be very good at but even if you look at like Dirk back in the day Dirk was considered like a good three-point shooter but then he didn't take that next step until he decided to play inside out yeah be physically imposing at 12 feet or whatever yeah 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 so Uh, that's my concern those are the top three guys I mean it's funny when you get to the top of the draft, you start talking about what people can't do. It's like in the back mm-hmm. half of the draft, you're like, Oh, his is his upside. When you get to the top and you're talking to three picks, cause it's a big deal to use a top three pick on someone. You start yep. to say like, you start to nitpick, right? You start to find holes in their games. Um, I haven't seen these guys nearly as much as you, but I think, mm-hmm. I think the sort of the insight into what they bring is super interesting and anyone going against the grain. I'm a fan of Raphael. Uh, let's come back. I want to talk to you specifically about some guys who might be in the Blazers draft range in the second segment. But first I want to tell my listeners about prize picks. It is the daily uh, fantasy option for all your NBA fans. And it's super fun, super easy to play. I think I've played a bunch and I think you will like it too. If you check it out, here's what you do. You pick between two and five players, you put them on your ballot and you, uh, and you're just picking over unders against the projections. You're not playing pros. You're not playing the field. You're just picking projections set by prize picks and you can do it on their app, an award-winning app available on the Google app store, as well as on your Apple products, or you can visit their website at prizepicks.com. Com. Super simple to use. You're picking points, rebounds, just the projections. You can win up to 10 times on each ballot. You can make your selections in under 60 seconds, and then you can get your money fast and easy with their safe withdrawals. And right now, they got a no-brainer offer. If you go to Prize Picks, download the app right now, go to Prize Picks, enter the promo code MBA, and the player on your first selection scores one point, you will get a free 50 bucks. So go ahead, get Josh Hart, put him on your put him on your first selection. <laughs> Use that promo code NBA, get a free $50. That's prizepicks.com or download the app. Prize Picks daily fantasy made easy. All right. We're still chatting here with lifelong Blazers fan, 
founder of NBA Draft Junkies, the director of scouting and NBA Big Board, and the host of Locked on NBA Draft, Rafael Barlow. We talked about the top picks in the draft. Now I want to talk about guys who are in the Blazers range. Portland is very likely to have two picks between 6 and 14. If things go well, they'll do what, what uh, Rafael wants, and they'll get Paolo Bancaro. But I think the more likely scenario is that they're picking twice with the selection, they their own selection, the one they're owed by the Pelicans, between 6 and 14. Are there some names in that range that you think would fit the Blazers well? You know, that's a tough question. I've been asking myself when I do these mocks because sure. I like to try to do my mock a little bit based off of fit. Mm-hmm. And the big question for me is, well, dang, although right. everything is pointing towards that he wants to be there, he's saying the right things, and I, I believe him. Oh, he's sure. coming back. He's, they're going to give him a – he's going to get a $100 million extension. He's coming back. I, I'm, right. Book it. But the question is, are they going to use those picks to trade for more veteran help? That's why I'm still trying to wonder, like, all right, you know, does does the Pistons take a top 10 pick for Jeremy Grant? Right. Are the Knicks looking to trade Julius Randle so Obi Toppin can get minutes? Do they want a first round top 10 pick? So I think the Blazers have options there. Sure. So if the team is constructed as is, and they were going to keep the pick. I think Arizona's Benedict Matherin mm-hmm. would be a pretty good pick there simply because he fits the three and D mode. He's athletic, even though now the Blazers are like one of the most athletic teams in the league. Now. <laughs> yeah. They really pivoted. <laughs> yes. They went from like a team that weren't like athletic. And now you got Greg Brown and Keon Johnson and you have so many athletes. So, um, But Benedict Matherin, I think he's a plug and play guy. I think that he is someone that you can, um, you know, just plug at the three. And the way I like that pick, because I think that he he's a good shooter. He has the athleticism. I think that he if he could develop a little bit more offensive creativity, like game off the dribble, then I think he could be a really good weapon. And I think the Blazers have done a good job in developing guys. I mean, from yep. Ant to Gary Trent to um, – I'm just trying to think of somebody else. They, yeah, they even have. Will Barton, Pat Connaughton, Jake Lehman. Like they have, they have found guys who are maybe just athletes and, and kind of made them into NBA players. So they have a pretty yeah. good track record of um, not that high in the draft. If they go that high in the draft, they, things haven't worked out as well. But when, yeah. they've, when they've picked deeper in the draft, they've developed guys. Um, they have – I mean, it's a new regime and all that, but like they – I. I I'm not and without a G League team. And, and yeah. so I mean, I, I live in Dallas, and so I know that they would send guys down to to Fort Worth and um, or not Fort Worth, I'm sorry. I used to work for the Fort Worth Flyers. Um the, the Texas Legends. Yeah, they would send guys down there. But I, you know, like I would go to Blazers games every time they came in Dallas, and I would get there super early just to watch. And those guys are working, the guys yep. that weren't playing in the rotation, they're there at five o'clock and they're putting in their work. And I remember talking to Gary Trenton at Simons one time and they knew they weren't playing, but man, they had like a full simulation style workout. So I'm a fan of the Blazers development and hopefully, you know, it's, even though it's a new regime, like you said, they continue that model. So yeah, I mean, I think a guy like Benedict Matherin, if he can develop a little bit more shot creation and game off the dribble, then I think he could be a really good steal because he has all the physical tools. Sure. It's just, he is literally that three and D guy where there's not much in between another guy that I think may be in that range. Keegan Murray might be in that range. If, if they're at like number six, you can make a case and say he's the best player in college basketball, maybe not the best NBA prospect, but you can make a case say he's the player of the year in college basketball. I think he would be a pretty decent fit. Hopefully they keep Nurkic. Yeah, I think That's, they will. I think they will. Yeah, is he a free agent this year? He will. He'll be entering unrestricted free agency, but um, I'm he's a guessing, clutch guy too. <laughs> yeah, he's going to make some money, but I think um, I think the reason he's not playing now, uh, entering free agency, he'd only missed three games due to COVID all year, yeah. and you know, for Nurk, it's a big deal just to be on the court. Yeah, um, he's not going to be sitting out with a minor injury. I don't think you know a, a plantar fasciitis that he injured somehow during the All Star break, the only downtime he's had all year. Um, <laughs> I don't think he'd be sitting out with, with something that maybe he could play through unless there's an understanding with the team that he's probably going to be back. Obviously yeah. there's a number he won't hit, but I think I would, you know, put it at 80 plus percent that Nurk's going to be back. Yeah. 
So if that's the case, yeah, Keegan Murray would be a good fit. I mean, I've seen people talk Johnny Davis. I, I like Johnny Davis. There are some concerns for me about his NBA fit because he's more of a, a mid-range shooter. And then um, I wonder, I mean, maybe you would know better than I would. Do you think they're going to play Dame and Ant together? I think the they're going to I think they're going to start those two guys, which um, seems pretty similar to what they did in the past. Uh, yeah. new, new flavor of guards under six foot four. But yeah, I, I think I'll say this. Um, Joe Cronin has been pretty clear. Blazers GM has been pretty clear that he will draft best player available. He is not afraid to draft a guard. So while that might not be the most like, I don't know, the, the easiest plug and play option, he will, if he thinks it's up there, he'll, you know, Ty Ty Washington could be, uh, could be someone he goes after type of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's tough because now, you know, you, you don't want to be Sacramento. You know, I, I get the best player available. I, I get that point, but you don't you don't want to be in a situation where okay, you took the best player available and now it's too redundant. And now, you know, somebody's unhappy, whether it's Dame or, or Ant, and then you end up having to get rid of, you know, so I I don't know about that. Um I, I like Jalen Duran, even though I think that, you know, Nurk is gonna be there. That doesn't make the most sense because Oh, and I mean, I love talking Blazers because the Blazers fans can relate. And I don't <laughs> want to, you know, I think Duran has some passing skills that he hasn't been able to showcase. And, um, and, and it's very interesting. This summer I was in Miami and saw Bam out of bio working out. And the question I wanted to ask him, I said, in your opinion, why do you think the Blazers selected Zach Collins <laughs> over, <laughs> over you? And I and I explained to him. I said I think he would have filled all the Blazers' needs from Boy, Woody. athleticism, a defensive anchor, another passer, so many things that the Blazers have lacked. Bam was there, and Bam said, "Well, you know, everybody that goes to Kentucky sacrifices." Yep. And he said that he felt like the Blazers thought that Zach Collins had a higher ups. But he said he didn't think the Blazers looked at what he could have done. Not, not necessarily the, only the Blazers, but other teams also. Yeah, did not you, look at what he did in high school as a passer. and Didn't pay attention to some of the flashes and glimpses that he had shown. And, and so because all they saw was what he sacrificed. And so I think with, with Jalen Duran, I think he does show some flashes of being a, a capable passer. But I also feel like his numbers would look a lot better if he actually had a real point guard getting him the ball. Every yep. basket that he's had this year it seems like he's had to like get it on his own, whether it was an offensive rebound or running the floor. And uh, I mean, there's no spacing in college basketball anyway. Right. But he didn't have someone that could get him in the paint and throw him alive, or you know, easy dump off baskets. And so, even though he may not be, not be the best fit next to Nurk. I, I love the, the fact that he's only 18 years old. He's still supposed to be in high school. He's supposed to be preparing for his prom right now. But he's athletic. He blocks shots. He plays hard, runs the floor. And, you know, the Blazers just having an athletic vertical lob threat big in a while. I mean, well, Hassan Whiteside? <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say J.J. Hickson maybe. It's been a, it's been, oh, wow. uh, yeah. it's been been some many moons. I, yeah, I'm not worried about, like, Duran is – he's – he wouldn't like, he wouldn't start on a good team almost certainly yep. next year. So like as a depth piece, the Blazers desperately need more front court help. I like him. I think he's a, yep. I think he's an interesting fit. It's just, if he, can he reach his potential if he's a backup for his first three seasons, I guess is a, a reasonable question, but the Blazers are operating on a pretty short timeline. How good can they be in the next two years? So if he, if he fills that need as a backup center, then checks the box, you keep it moving. Yep. Yep. Let's uh, I like I want, Tar Eason. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me. You like Tar Eason? I I've been um I've watched three LSU games now. I'm excited about Tar Eason. Tell me why you like him. Just a versatility. He's someone that I mean, he's athletic. He defends. He still seems a little bit raw, but he shows flashes of being able to create his own shot. The assist numbers don't necessarily tell the whole story, but I've seen him make some pretty good reads as a passer. Um. I just see him as like the Swiss army knife glue guy that I think, you know, if you put him on a team, like what I expect the Blazers to be next year, I think that he could really maximize his 
his talent because he has, you know, adequate players or stars around him to where he can just be that complimentary piece. And then he's someone that I think, I don't know how good he would look on just a, I don't want to, I mean, I don't know, like an Orlando magic, a, a bad team with a bunch of guys that are all fighting for their first or their second NBA contract and are trying to establish themselves in the league with no, you know, real hierarchy on the roster. I think if you put them on a team where you got your, all right, Dame is our guy, Ann is our guy, Nurk is our guy. Now, now we just need complimentary pieces around them. That's where I think he would be best at. Yeah, if, if nothing else, like the hierarchy, the Blazers structure is more sound than a lot of other teams in the lottery. Now, they might not use these picks. They might trade them away. So yeah. then you're going to end up on a team like Detroit or Orlando, yeah. uh, Houston, OKC type of thing. But like, yeah, I, I think there's something to that where it's like the the guys who are sort of more raw and kind of like, oh, he's an energy guy and he's not going to be he's, he doesn't have star potential, but he's going to be a long term good NBA player, maybe like Eason, where it's like he fits Portland's plan. You know, yep. like he don't, he don't, if he's, if he can never scale up to be the second option on a team, perfect. <laughs> because yeah. he will, ne- in Portland, it's not going to, at least in the near future, not going to happen where he'd be asked to do that. Right. Uh, yep. I agree. Uh, I got a couple more questions for you. Let's come back, close out the show and I'll, uh, I'll ask them for you. But first I want to tell my listeners about Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market. I have been, if you're a long time listener, you have heard me tell you about Built Bars for what seems like forever. They're great. I've been eating them forever. A long time ago, many... Th- Closing in on three years ago, Bill Bar sent me a box and they said, try these and tell your listeners how good they are. I did. I tried them. I liked them. And then since then, I've been spending my own dang money to buy these protein bars because they're delicious. The average Bill Bar, 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, four grams of sugar, and just four net carbs. My personal favorites are cookies and cream and peanut butter brownie, but they got something for everybody. Coconut almond, raspberry, double chocolate, salted caramel. You're going to find what you like. All tasty, all healthy. Go to built.com. Use a promo code locked 15. You'll get 15% off your next order. That's promo code lock 15 for 15% off at built.com. Still a pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond. We're still listening to Lockdown Blazers. We're still chatting here with Raphael Barlow, who's many things but also a lifelong Blazer fan, a draft expert, and a lifelong Blazer fan. Uh, Raphael, we've talked a bunch about draft guys. I want to ask you just sort of like how this next month works. Uh, this is Wednesday, March 16th show. Uh, so the NCAA tournament, the men's NCAA tournament is going to begin the next day. For me, this is most of the college basketball I watch. I'm going to put too much stock into these games. I'm going to see, you know, I'm going to see Keegan Murray score 31 in an opening round uh, NCAA tournament game. And I'm going to be like, he's the one. Um, How do you, as someone who does this full time, how do you balance NCAA tournament versus all the other sort of studying you've done of prospects? And I'll be honest, that's something that I think I may struggle with because again, like I said, in the opening segment, I'm still a fan first. Right. And you're supposed to like turn off your, your fandom and just be as unbiased, which I try my best to be. Like I was just telling a friend of mine, I went to watch him play in, in the city in Italy a couple of days ago. I was like, this is the first game I've watched in the last six months where I didn't have my notes out and I wasn't paying attention to little details. And during the NCAA tournament, I'm going to watch it as a fan. There you go. Because I mean, the guys have a body of work. It's, it's like at least 32, 33 games. And you don't want to judge a guy after one or two games, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I mean, you look at Johnny Juzang last year. Right. He had a great run. And it was easy to forget about some of the things that are concerning. And then once he got to the combine, it, you know, those, uh, you know, the, the lack of athleticism or whatever, it kind of stood out. And then he ended up having to go back to school. But then we've seen guys like, I mean, Joe Alexander is a guy that I consider a friend, but Joe was not on, you know, he was kind of maybe first round pick, had a great NCAA tournament, ends up being like the eighth pick in the draft. Yeah, exactly. I thought he was seventh. Like he was he yeah, went. Some, somewhere like that. Yeah. So you don't want to, um, you don't want a situation like that. But I mean, I think that you can't put too much stock into it. But even the thing about college basketball that I like, and I think you can even compare it to like, player evaluation, maybe not always the best team wins. Sure. It's the hottest team. <laughs> Whoever's the hottest team during this, you know, three week to four week stretch is, is the best team. And so um, a guy could be hot for three or four games. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's a better prospect than, 
whatever. So I, you know, it's it's hard not to. You know, I remember like Jabari Parker when you had he played absolutely awful in the I forgot who they played like Bucknell or something like that, <laughs> and they lost. And I wasn't the biggest Jabari guy anyway. So of course, in my mind, it's like, see, I told you he's no good. Exactly. And then looking back at it, he's like 25 or 26 and he's out of the league already. So, and that's the case where somebody could have been like, see, I, I told you so, but it was somebody else. I can't think of it right now that had like, I think Chris Paul had like a really, really bad NCAA tournament game, his last game. And it has, I mean, obviously he's going to have a hall of fame yeah, career. He's like one of the five best point guards of all time. Yeah. But I wonder, does like, you know, Atlanta, did they say, oh, well, you know what, this game was whatever. And I think Marvin Williams was on the North Carolina team that won a championship this year. And they were great. He was great for him. Yeah. Played and he it. came off the bench, but it's like, that was a, a franchise changing mistake. Yeah. <laughs> because and I'm not saying they judge Chris Paul off that one particular game, but, you know, I guess the allure of Marvin Williams made them think that they, he had a bigger upside than Chris Paul. And that was, like I said, a franchise changing mistake. So I, I say go by the body of work, not, not just the short two or three game stretch. Right. The two weekends. There was a, a, a an NBA executive once told me that he always knew who Kevin McHale was going to draft because he would just find out which uh, college tournament McHale went to the previous weekend. If he went to the big 10 tournament, he was going to take whatever the best prospect in the big 10 was. If he went to the Pac 12 tournament, he's going to take whatever the best prospect in the big 12 was he's, or in Pac 12 was. It's like, you know, even at the NBA level, at the highest level, some guys get enamored by two really good two weeks. And I think, uh, like you said, if if you've been doing it since September, I mean, you got to update your priors. Maybe uh, someone who you thought was Channing Fry is now more uh, closer to Dirk or something like that, somewhere in between. Yeah. But yeah, I love like, that quote. You had GM scouting GMs to understand what GMs are thinking in the draft. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, you. Hey, listen, people. This stuff. You know, we're not, oh, not. Fans aren't the only ones tracking private planes or whatever it is. You know, like. Yeah. <laughs> People know, at least talking to guys in the league, they know, oh yeah, they sent their scouts to Madison Square Garden. They were they were there. You know, everybody yeah. knows who's who's watching. I'm sure you see that when you're out there scouting is like, oh, you work for hmm, you work for the Nets? Okay. I see. I see. Yeah. Interesting. I, I think of Magic Johnson would be like the typical guy who I could see where he would look at the NCAA tournament and he seems like Magic is more so a fan than anything else. And yeah, yeah. Get totally caught up in. I mean, oh, like, yeah. you can pull up his old tweets. I think there was one tweet where he said he would have taken a uh, Brandon Knight number one in the draft or something like that. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, LeBron really likes Shabazz Napier after a heck of a tournament run. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Be so careful out there. True. Yeah. yeah, and then the Heat, the heat literally, and the Heat I mean, did drafted. Yeah, yeah. Shabazz told me he's like, there. I know why I became a member of the Heat. Because I, he's like, it's not a secret. I know why I, I ended up there. Because when when Baz was in Portland, he uh, he was very open about his path. Um, Raphael, one thing I really like about you is that you do player comps better than most. Because Thank there you. is some weird thing where where when we get to this time of year and we're saying, who does this guy remind you of? I just am a, uh, guilty of it right now. I just compared a 18 year old kid to Dirk Nowitzki. That's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair. Um, what is the art of a player comp and why are you more than others not compelled to compare everyone to a first ballot hall of famer? Oh man, you know, man, I get so many negative comments on YouTube. If I compare a guy to a role player and it's just like, I don't, not everybody in this draft is going to be a superstar. And I tell people look at every draft and if it's the eighth pick in the draft, go down the last 20 years, what the eighth pick was, you might get four all-stars. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> not everybody is going to be, you know, a, a superstar. So that's one of my things is I try to compare, like maybe like the, sometimes maybe style of play, sometimes body type. Um, but I just, I think I just understand, like, not everybody is going to be a, a Hall of Famer or, and it, but even like with players, like I sat in last year during some pre-draft interviews and every player, and it was like a trick question. Who do you see yourself who, who like, you know, what player has a similar role? Who do you think that you play like? And every single player, and these guys weren't, I mean, these guys were probably top 100 prospects. None. I mean, if 
I wouldn't have been able to sit in an interview if they were at like the combine. So these right, were right, guys right. that were some of them kind of got a crack at the league during that three week stint during COVID. Sure. <laughs> they, but every one of them compared themselves to at least a top six rotation player. I think the only guy that compared himself to that didn't compare himself to like a superstar. He compared himself to Lou Williams. There you go. So again, you're comparing yourself to a guy that's played like 15 or 16. Yeah, the years NBA's all time leading scorer in bench and <laughs> bench points. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I'm just not afraid to compare a guy to a role player. I think maybe I just understand or, or have a, a good understanding or, or appreciate the value of role players. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like you don't if you see a skinny dude who can dribble. He might not be Kevin Durant. He might be yeah. Richard Lewis. And it's like, yeah. Richard Lewis kicks ass. If you end up being Richard Lewis in the league, you had an incredible career. Kevin, like you $100 million did, deal. <laughs> yeah, like you did really well for yourself. But yeah. everyone's like, oh, Richard Lewis, is that an insult? It's like, no. Some dudes are one-time all-stars. Most players in the league are role players. The Channing Fry thing. He said, 80% of the league is role players. He That's played like 13 it. years. Yeah, he shot 40% it's, from three. Yeah. yeah and it's like, yeah. I don't know. I guess I'm just not afraid to not label a guy a superstar. And that's, you know, that's that's probably the biggest thing. And we can easily get caught up in seeing how well a guy dominates college basketball and and think that that's going to be his right. His trajectory in the NBA, which I which I which I understand that it's not. So I, like, I think that's just it. Mostly I'm not afraid to compare a guy to someone who is not a superstar. You had one on the, uh, on Lockdown's draft show where you said, in my notes, he's most similar to Frank Nielakina. And I was like, now that is bravery. <laughs> this is, oh, this yeah. is, this is bravery. As someone uh, said, Jaden Springer, Jaden Springer, <laughs> he said, he's, he's reminds me of Frank Nielakina. And I was watching the show and I was like, wait, you're not going to hear that anywhere else. Like you're not, you're not going to hear, you know, it's got like, all about that. Yeah. And, but you know, I think, that it's going to be such a negative connotation on that comparison because Frank was the top 10 pick, right? You know, but if Frank was a, the 23rd pick in the draft, which I think Jaden Springer went around that range. Now that's a value pick, right? You know, yeah, you pick someone in the twenties who signs a second contract in the league. You did a good job. Uh, it's, it is hard to stay in the NBA every year. 30 guaranteed dudes come to take your job. If you, if you stick for a second and a third one, you did great. You had a great career. But you know, th this is why I really appreciate Locked On because this is like your, your barbershop conversation yeah. with guys that have a much better understanding than the guys in the barbershop, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So usually when you talk like sports, you know, you, you have your friend you talk sports with, but the Locked On guys are like, it's, it's a different level of fandom like you know it's a deeper level. obviously if you're spending your time doing these podcasts and watching games you have to like more than love it like you're oh yeah it, it, it's something that you you know you're looking to make a living out of it so you know when you compare someone to Frank Nilakina, it's not going to just send off the you know make people angry and, and say you're saying this kid is a bust you understand like okay yeah even though Frank was a top 10 pick, he's on a second contract. He may be out the Mavs rotation now, but he's probably going to pick up a third. And if he plays seven years, that's, <laughs> that's you, you listen, you did great. You did great. Yeah. If you play, if you, if you put, if you push a decade in the league, you talked about Marvin Williams earlier, Marvin Williams, like franchise altering mistake, right? Not drafting Chris Paul. Marvin Williams played 15 years in the league. Yes. It's a great, it's a great pick. <laughs> At, at two, if you get a if you get a guy at two who plays more than a decade in the league, that's like a positive outcome. That is, yeah. um, it's a mistake because you could have drafted a Hall of Famer. Um, shout out to the Blazers and Martell Webster, but um, there are there are worse outcomes, say Martell, than Marvin Williams. It's um, and I think that's this time of year you got to remember that you're mostly drafting role players, and if you hit a star, if you draft Damian Lord at six, you got to remember that T. Rob went right before him. If you draft. Uh, CJ McCollum at 10, you got to remember that Cody Zeller and Ben McLemore went ahead of him in the draft. It's like you draft Bam Adebayo, you got to look at the top 10 and realize, oh, Josh Jackson, huh? How about it? Like, yes, yeah. this is an inexact science, and most dudes aren't stars. And I think you do a really good job of saying, like, hey, some of most of these dudes are going to be second, you know, two contract guys. And if you find someone who signs a third, you did really well. Yeah. This is why I love talking with the locked on guys because. 
the average fan is not going to remember Thomas Robinson went ahead of Dane Miller. <laughs> you know <what> I'm saying? <laughs> so I, I love it because, you know, it just reminds me of how deep I am into it. And it's yeah. also a group of guys that are very similar that you can have like really deep old, you know, I mean, you remember Martel Webster. Yeah, you there know? you go. Seattle prep zone, <laughs> baby. Yeah. I worked for the Fort Worth Flyers that year. And that was when they sent Martel, Sergey Monia. Um, oh my gosh, it was somebody else. Remember the Russian Victor? Victor Kar- Piapa. Kar- yeah, they sent them all down with Bill Baino. Yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, man, I, I remember that. And, you know, the average fan isn't going to remember Martel Webster. <laughs> oh, here <laughs> you, you know? go. The average, here, I'll grab this off my uh, shelf. This is for the YouTube crowd. This is an autographed Sergey Monia card that's on the shelf right there. You don't have, an, you don't have many other nerds like me on the, on, uh, on your, in your Sergey Monia. <laughs> yeah, man. The, the autographed Sergey Monia. That's real. Um, that's, uh, it's, there's just not a lot of those out there. Uh, Raphael, I'll let you get out of here. Uh, go to NBA draft junkies.com. Listen to Raphael on the locked on NBA draft show. He's a, he's a weekly rotating host and check out bigboard.com, the director of scouting there. No one's going to get you closer to obscure European prospects and Raphael. And he's also plugged into the college basketball stuff. He's doing good work. Check him out where you can find him. Raphael, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Anytime. I'm glad we were able to make this happen. I have a friend of mine. He listens to Locked on Blazers. He okay. listens to it all the time. And so uh, we argue about the takes because he used to always say, well, the Locked on Blazers fans said Ant Simons can't dribble. So I don't know if I remember that part of it. So he's always asking me, when am I going to be? You know, I was like, well, I feel weird saying, hey, man, can I come on your Let show? Me get on. All right. Well, now that you've now that we've uh, now that we've like whatever broken that wall. Right now we'll get get you back soon. Also, the Blazers can, they have four draft picks, so we're going to need your help. Uh, they have two second rounders. I don't know anyone else who's going to be able to give me real insight on second rounders. So I'm bringing you back soon here. Uh, Thank we'll, you so uh, much. Yeah, we'll talk about. Uh, We'll talk about deep draft guys. Listeners, tell your friends about this podcast. Tell them to find it wherever they get podcasts. Make your first listen every day, five days a week, free on all platforms. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.